50 miles a day, but what they really needed to do was lighten the load for these mail carriers. And so they were really stringent with the weight that these horses and riders carried, where their clothing was light. They, they had thinner, lighter saddles that they rode on. Some horses didn't ha- had smaller horseshoes or even some none at all. The, the pouches, the satchels that they carried were lighter. And, and they really made an effort to make these stringent weight requirements. However, they gave each rider something that they said weight is not an issue. And each rider of the Pony Express carried a full-size Bible. Why? Because they needed it. It was a great source of life and encouragement to them. The same ought to be true for us with the Word of God. It is a necessity, and we have to realize the importance and primacy of God's Word in our lives. And sadly, I think too many of us do not treat it that way. This is the one item that maybe some of us do not put above all others. We do not run to it often enough. We do not feed from it often enough, but it is crucial in the disciple's life. In fact, authentic Christians have always been, we have a Guatemalan missionary we support, and I love when he says that, we are, we are people of the book. He always says that. We have always been people of the book, of God's word. In fact, the Protestant Reformation resulted from a desire of authentic believers to base all they knew on the word of God, choosing to recognize scripture as the final authority for all life, for matters of life and godliness in the scriptures. Now you and I know that like not all the answers of what house to buy, what job to take are in the scriptures, but it, if it says that we have all that we need, maybe not the specifics, God truly means he has given us everything we need in the word. After all, God reveals himself to us in it and gives us Jesus Christ himself which is the word made flesh. We learn that usually around Christmas time in John chapter 1. We learn that about Jesus Christ. Well, here in our passage in Psalm 119, the psalmist, not unique to us at times, finds himself in trouble. I know you can't relate to that, right? Maybe some of us have found ourselves in a circumstance or a trial or a challenge to God for help. We have to consider why he would do this. Why do we He does this because he expects his help to come through God and his word. And so we'll look at this passage. You'll see six related statements. We'll go through them. I'll just give them all to you, and then we'll go through them one at a time. Uh, But there's the six points that I'll make this morning about what God's word is. Number one, it revives our souls. Number two, it is wonderfully gracious. Number three, it sustains our strength. Number four, it replaces our falsehood. Number five, it is a priority for obedience. And number six, it brings freedom and joy for our hearts. So the first one we see is God's word revives our souls. The psalmist is found here at the beginning of what we read in a desperate state. He declares that he is so weak. In fact, he says it this way, my soul clings to the dust. He is found in the dirt and muck of life. Not literally, perhaps, but as we would identify with, he is down there on the ground, I'm sure, weeping, distressed, and there he is. And being in such a weakened state as he turns to God, uh, and he asks for something that I'm not convinced that many of us would ask him to do. And he says this, give me life according to your word. Now that's interesting because when we are in a discouraged or difficult circumstance sometime, do we often ask God to give us life according to his word or do we just ask him to fix our problem? Do we ask him to strengthen us and give us hope through his word or do we turn to our own understanding to fix our, our problems? When, when, when we do that, and I fear we often do this, in, in desperation, when circumstances are challenging, the, the question is, do we pause before God, or and you can see the contrast, or do we freak out? Many of us do that, right, in, in front of the world. Do we pause before God in those moments, or do we kind of, in anxiety, freak out in the midst of others? And you can see the contrast there. The psalmist here has full, full confidence in the power of what God's word is. And so he goes to him. Samuel Clark wrote this. Live themselves 
of their most solid comforts by their unbelief and forgetfulness of God's promises. For there is no tragedy so great, but there are promises suitable to it and abundantly sufficient for our relief in it. In other words, we can go to God in confidence when we have trials because of his rich and precious precious promises. So if you are weary today, Psalm 119 teaches us to ask God to revive our soul, to give us life according to his word. And this is especially true of the one who has never trusted Jesus Christ by faith, that only through him and his finished work at the cross you can know God and be known by God. So our hearts ought to ask God to revive our soul and to strengthen us according to the word. That's the first one, it revives. The second one is this, God's word is wonderfully gracious. The psalmist has poured out his heart in verse 26, and he says, when I told you my ways, you answered me. When I told you my ways, do you cast, that's a prayer really in Psalm 119, do you cast your anxieties upon God in that way? Or do you, like many of us do, try to manage your worry? That's what many of us do. You see, many believers are good at this. We, we, we have this operation mode that we kind of manage all the worries and anxieties of life. But the scriptures tell us to do otherwise. They say, cast all of those on God. Why? Because he cares for you. We learn that in 1 Peter 5, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. When we are in need, we are to go boldly before the throne of grace and confidence. And Hebrews 4 tells us we find mercy and help there. So why don't we do that more often? You know what happens when we go to God? It says it right there. God is so wonderfully gracious to answer. Samuel Clark, who I read for just briefly before, he continues on about this when he says, a thorough acquaintance with the promises of God, that if you know the promises of God, would be of the greatest advantage in prayer. What comfort is it that Christians address themselves to God in Christ when he considers the repeated assurance that his prayers shall be heard? Our prayers are heard by God. That should amaze us that God in his greatness and bigness, would desire to hear our prayers. Now, I realize some of you may have just heard that and say, I don't know if I agree with that. Maybe you've prayed certain th- for th- certain things and certain prayers, and you say, God hasn't answered me. He hasn't done it before, and he hasn't answered me still. Well, let me challenge all of us, myself included, with this. Let me ask you this question. Have you asked him what you want, or have you asked him what he wants for you to want. Do you get that? Have you asked him for what you want? Or have you just asked him what we should be asking is for what he wants us to want, that the desires of this thing is on the wrong side. I preach with it on the other side. I'm going to be okay. Yeah, I'll make it. I always preach with it on this side. He ought to be challenging our hearts in this way that we don't ask him a bunch of questions like, I want this, I want you to take this problem. What we ought to be asking is, God, would you change my heart to be more like yours in the midst of those circumstances? The psalmist here has poured out his heart to God, and do you see what he asks for in the text? To teach him God's statutes. That is so counterintuitive to us. When we have a problem or circumstances, we ask God, would you take this pain away? Would you, would you go into this situation? Would you make your will known to me? And what the psalmist does here is he said, God, in the middle of this desperation, soul clinging to the dirt, the dust, he says, God, would you teach me your law? When you collapse in the dirt, do you ask God to teach you his statutes? That doesn't come first nature to us. We often want him to intervene, and you'll see why he would ask for that. If you look at verse 27 there, make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will what? Meditate on your wondrous works. This is difficult. Believe me, I know personally for me, here he asked God to teach him so that he could understand his wonders. The word of God is where we learn the truth about God and who he is, what he expects, and how he acts, his promises. His promises. 
So often we want God again to fix our problems and we don't really desire to know him. We desire for him to fix what's wrong with our lives. And it's different here. The psalmist, while in the midst of hardship, wants God's help in understanding not just his ways, but he wants to meditate on how wondrous God is. That's the attitude we see there. And so when you and I are weak and afraid, asking God to show himself, can remind us of his greatness and unbreakable promises. And that is what brings encouragement. The word of God is not only where we learn about who God is and what he expects, it is how is where we learn and where we hear from God. That is where God speaks. This book is where God speaks. Nowhere else. In Hebrews it says, long ago and many times in many ways God spoke by the prophets, but now he has spoken through his son. And this is where we hear God speak. There is no other place. And now he said, well, I heard you can, well, I heard God's voice the other day. The Spirit speaks to us through the word, but it's always going to be in, in parallel to God's word. It's never going to be another vehicle. That's where God speaks. And in his grace, he gives us what we need And he is wonderfully gracious for that reason. So that's the second one. Revives our souls. It's wonderfully gracious. And third, it sustains our strength. The psalmist declares in verse 28, and this is sorrowful language here, that grief causes him to collapse. It's meaning here literally to drop like rain. He says, my soul melts away for sorrow. Now many of us don't speak that way, but I'm sure we have felt that way, that our soul melts away for sorrow. And so he asks God for what? To strengthen and establish him by God's word. Now this is different than reviving our soul because this is that thing that keeps us going and moving on in perseverance. This is the power of God's word to strengthen the weak. Now some of you who are here know this about our lives personally. Some of you don't. Many of you don't. Uh, We have four children. Jeremiah is our second. Our oldest is at Bethel College in the Twin Cities. And then we have a a eighth grade girl. And then we have our youngest is Josiah. And he's 11 years old. He's in a wheelchair. He doesn't speak or walk. And he has a lot of medical needs. And at 11 years, this has been a long 11 years, he needs constant care and attention. And many kids that age are usually independent to a degree, right? And he is, is in all, all that he needs is just constant care. And sometimes that's exhausting. And it's been a long 11 years for my wife and I and our whole family, in fact. And sometimes I get a little too far ahead of myself and think about, well, what does that look like down the road for Carrie and I? Here's a young guy who needs constant care. And I get exhausted by the thought of, of not knowing how that all ends. Like, like he, like looking ahead, I mean, many of us are in this category of life, even in this room. Like, will we ever be able to retire from that? And, and again, your kids, and so I get this whole idea that sometimes in life you can't even see the finish line. And that can be self-defeating. That can be exhausting. And so what the psalmist says here is, when I'm weak in that, where do we run through for sustenance and strength? I know that I need to trust like the psalmist does as he believes firmly that God's word will strengthen him, sustain him in all that God has brought before him. I'm asking, do you view God's word in this way? As if God doesn't know what we're experiencing. And I think sometimes we forget that all that God has given us in our lives, he has given us from his sovereign hand. Now, some of us would say, well, that's not a very kind thing God has done, but he has purpose in all of it. And so if I believe that, that God is over all the details of my life, and I believe that God has given us Josiah the way that he is for the purposes that he has, I ought to believe that he will sustain me for that which he has called me. Think about it. You can't have it both ways. If I trust that all is from God's hand for my life, I also ought to equally believe that he will provide the sustenance I need through his word. And so thirdly, God's word sustains. Fourth, God's word replaces our falsehood. The psalmist, like we ought to, recognizes his predisposition towards sin. And if you're here this morning, you ought to recognize that about yourself yourself. 
that by our very nature, we are prone to wander, prone to sin. And he also recognizes that he is also surrounded by people who are in unrepentant sin. They're just doing whatever he wants. And he kind of, seeing that contrast, wants to distance himself from that. And so he makes this by way of form uh, a confession or request here. There we see in, in verse 29, put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. This is an important lesson here. He is very self-aware of his tendency to do what he wants and seek after his own pleasure. You see, you have to recognize that Satan is always against us, operating against us to deceive us towards putting our hand towards pleasures and sinfulness, what we want and away from the Lord. And I say deceiving us because that's what the enemy does to us in our sin. He lies to us constantly and tricks us. He convinces us that this is better than God, that this pleasure is more pleasurable than knowing God himself. And if you know that, you know about your own sin, when you run towards that, not only does it enslave us, but it also always leaves us disappointed. Sin has a very short shelf life of pleasure, doesn't it? It truly does. If you, if you run towards something, you might get pleasure for a moment, but you soon learn that's not as great as I thought it was. Think about the last thing that you ran for by temptation for pleasure. And I ask you this, did it satisfy you? Sure, in the short term, it does. But it doesn't give you what you really wanted. It makes you feel empty again, which is why the psalmist recognizing that approaches God word, God's word and declares this, I choose the way of faithfulness. Put false ways from me. You're gracious. Teach me the way of your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I have set your rules before me. He's chosen a different path. When Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, he indicated that believers would need his help, right? We learn this from the Lord's Prayer. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so after asking God to take away the way of deceit, he asked God, this psalmist, to replace it with something, to graciously give him the law. He is asking God to give him God's word so he can obey it with God's help, replacing that which is displeasing to God with that that is pleasing to God. And I wonder if that's a common request of ours as Christ followers. We know the whole run from sin thing, but do we ask God to replace it with his word? And when we do that, his word replaces what is false within us and brings our awareness to what is satisfactory and true joy. You and I are prone to think this, that rules by nature are fun killers. You know that when you grow up and your parents make a bunch of rules and Jeremiah's probably nodding and said like, yeah, you're my dad and you have tons of rules and they're all fun killers. But what we need to recognize is God knows what we need And he knows exactly how we ought to live that would make maximum use of how he created us and bring him maximum glory. And so these guidelines, these rules, these rails are actually life-giving. And that's what we find in his word, his perfect way, a way of life over the world's way of life. And so God replaces what is false. God's word replaces what is false in us. And number five, God's word is a priority for our obedience. By now, you can clearly see the psalmist treasures God's word. And note that in verse 25, if you look back there, he says, my soul clings to the dust. By the time you get to verse 31, it says, I cling to your testimonies. Do you see that? That transformation in his life? Here's where my heart was. Here's where my soul was. But when you're drawn to God's word, your whole perspective changes. And since he clings to God's word, He has hope to hope and pray what he is praying. He asks God not to let him be put to shame, not allowing him to sin or be defeated by the enemy. He is essentially here asking for God's blessing. J.I. Packer wrote this, True Christians are people who acknowledge and live under the word of God written in the book of truth, believing the teaching, trusting the promises, and following the commands. He says their eyes are upon the God of the Bible as their father and the Christ of the Bible as their savior. The promises are before them as they pray and the precepts are before them as they go about their daily tasks. 
You see that daily tasks. In the disciples' life, the word of God isn't just a part of your life. It is your priority in life. Just like those Pony Express riders, they had all these weight restrictions, but one thing they could not live without, and that was the word of God. It was for them daily as a priority. And it should be the one thing that we do not travel without, so to speak. You see, in John 17, Jesus prayed and asked God to sanctify his disciples with what? John 17, 17, sanctify them with the truth. Your word is truth. Notice Jesus did not ask God to sanctify people through trials and hardship and tribulation. God does grow us through those things, but Jesus asked the Father for his disciples, sanctify them with the truth. In other words, the word of God is what changes and transforms us. It's what renews our heart. It's what reveals our need for Jesus Christ as Savior. It's what, what makes us aware to turn from our sin and cling to God himself and treasure him above all else. And so it must be a priority. If all these things are true then about God's word, then we get to our last point. And this is really the application from the text itself at the end. Number six, God's word brings freedom and joy for our hearts. You see, the psalmist here runs the way in the way of God's commands parallel to the way of faithfulness and in contrast to the way of deceit and is seeking simply now to just obey God's word. This involves living then in God's prescribed way of life. And to do that, you have to do something else first. You have to turn away from your own Now you say, when it's a good question, why would one do that? And we know the world doesn't necessarily do that. Why would one turn away from the way that he thinks about how we ought to live? First, you have to recognize that you need something greater than yourself. That you must value God and treasure him more highly than yourselves and recognize that by yourself, As John 15 says, apart from me, you can do nothing, Jesus says, that you have an empty, hollow life. And the only source that could ever fill that with freedom and joy is God himself. Do you see the end of verse 32 here? When he says, I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. He runs in that way because God has enlarged his heart. Do you see it there? What does that mean except that in those ways and only in those ways is found true joy and life? It is only there that freedom and joy are found. You see, our hearts are shackled and bound in sin unless God's revealed word sets them free. And that's just the nature of how that works. You and I are bound and shackled in sin. And when we run to God's word, that is the only thing that sets us free. And who is this, but you ask, but Jesus Christ himself. Again, I say the word made flesh. And only in him do we find freedom and true joy. Which why Jesus would say these words in John 15 then makes sense. When he says, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. And then Jesus makes this offer to all of us. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then he says this in verse 11 of chapter 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. We read that Jesus had like a reason why he said that. If you, then I. Do you see it? God loves us enough to send us his very son, and I hope you know that today, how much Jesus is for you and loves you. And because of that love, he invites himself towards us, and he says this, if you obey my commandments, you're going to stay in that sweet spot of my love. If you, then I will give you joy, and it will be found complete. If you do this, my joy will be in you and it will be full in the sweet spot of his abiding love. And so there we see looking to God's ex- or Jesus' example and praise God for his example, which he already lived for us in perfection. We can have our hearts set free and live in abundant joy. 
John 15 isn't a call to perfection, by the way. We'd be foolish to think in our religious ways that, oh, well, we have to get it all right for God to love us. Jesus has already done that for us. Jesus went and lived a perfect life. He was the perfect lamb and sacrifice so that he could die a sinner's death, be buried and rise again for us. God already knows who we are when he sent his son Jesus for us. He kept the whole law because we couldn't. And so here it's not about, well, you need to check all the boxes and get everything right. God knows our hearts. In Psalm 103, he says, remember, we're dust and he knows our frame. We don't have to live perfectly. Christ already did that for us, but our aim ought to be perfection. Just like the psalmist, to always turn back in repentance towards God and his word. To keep that call of trusting the grace of Christ. And so I challenge you today to run into this promise, run to the word and live in it because God's word revives our souls. God's word is wonderfully gracious. God's word will sustain you in strength. It will replace your falsehood. It will be a priority for your obedience. And this, it will bring freedom and joy for your heart. And so trust Christ today and place your faith in him as Lord and Savior. The word of God never disappoints. Let me pray for us. Father in heaven, you are so gracious and kind. And you are rich in love and mercy. And God, we thank you for your grace that abounds. God, I thank you so much for your word, and as we learn from this psalmist today, I understand that there may be some of us that are found in struggle or challenge or trial. Sometimes we feel like our soul is clinging to the dust. And God, what we can learn here is that you want to take that heart that is lowly and turn it towards you for for refreshment, for strength, for sustenance. And so God, I just pray for us as a people that we would look to your word and not, as we learn in Proverbs 3, that we would not lean on our own understanding, but that we would look to you and trust in who you are, trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us. And if there is one that doesn't know you, that they would trust in Jesus Christ personally as their Lord and Savior. Father, that we would be a people that, that proclaim the truth that you are a treasure that we would desire nothing else but you, and that, Father, that you would keep us from sin and that we would desire you more. Father, you alone satisfy our hearts, and I pray that we would live in that. Give us wisdom from your Spirit today to apply these truths that we've learned, to start reading the Bible, maybe, if we've never read it, in a, in a, in a daily way. Father, help us to be running to your word instead of running to others for wisdom or opinions that we would desire for you to transform our hearts. And Father, I thank you for this time. I pray most of all that we would know only freedom and joy will be found in you and your word. And so let us cling to it. Let us run to it. Let us know how much you love us in the person of Jesus Christ, what you did for us. And Father, we sing about that now in in proclamation and worship, that great are you, Lord. Father, thank you for Emmaus Church. Thank you for the blessing that this ministry is to the people in Edgerton, to the people here. Thank you for Luke and Renee and their family. I pray that you bless them richly and that we would look to you and we pray these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said. Why don't we stand together and we'll sing this last song, proclaiming it, Great are you, Lord.